I am Robert Dafford. I am in Lafayette, Louisiana, USA, and I am on the site of a mural in downtown Lafayette, a piece about the environment. I had painted this mural actually 38 years ago here in Lafayette uh, at a time when some uh, very large developers were wanting to fill in the wetlands and turn it into a commercial wonderland. And I thought about how horrible it would be to lose the greatest wetlands in America. And uh, I uh, thought of all of the the animals and the insects and the plants that would disappear. There would be nothing left but pages in a magazine, nothing left but photographs. And so the insects are trying to escape from the photograph, escape from the magazines, escape from the postcards. So it's called Escape from the Postcards. And uh, as I said, it was 38 years old, so now I am I am repainting it and making it better than it was originally. Are you using similar materials to what you had used 30 years ago? Oh, um, no, it's a better paint, uh, but um, similar in a way. This is an industrial coating, which is tougher, but the colors uh, are, you just cannot get. The paint companies will not give us permanent pigments. They will only give us dyes. The permanent pigment paints, uh, the uh, such as the chyme mineral silicates, those paints cost two hundred fifty dollars for one gallon, and I need forty fifty gallons to paint this painting. So it's just not feasible. But it's the best paint that I can get for the project. When did you start this project? This uh, this uh, restoration that I'm doing right now, uh, I've been working part time for about six weeks. How big it is? It is um, seven meters tall, and uh, what would that be? It's a hundred feet, which is uh, thirty twenty uh, thirty meters long seven meters tall would it be possible to go a little closer and kind of explain it piece by piece well i was thinking when i started this painting that uh, one of the thoughts in my head was that even the tiniest smallest little bit of nature is full of complexity even the the tiniest little butterfly has an entire world i thought if i could make the tiniest things very very big then we would be more inclined to look into them and see there are whole worlds inside even the smallest little space and the smallest tiniest little things have so much to give us and teach us so I was trying to incorporate that idea. Let's take the very tiny realism and blow it up the tiniest realities and make them very large. And then we would be forced to look at them. So that was one thought uh, I had here. These insects migrate through here and this bird, it migrates through here. The painted bunting is the most, one of the most exotic birds that migrates in Louisiana. It comes here every year on the way to Mexico for the winter. And then it comes back from Mexico and it lands in Louisiana and eats and rests the, the painted buntings and then fly north again to their habitat. <clears throat> and right now, all of the migratory patterns of all of the birds all over the world are being disrupted uh, by development of various kinds. Commercial, industrial, residential development is uh, destroying the habitats where the migrating birds pass through. <clears throat> so I wanted to call attention to that, to say this beautiful, beautiful, tiny little creature that comes here is not going to come here anymore because they are destroying developments, oil companies, uh, 
neighborhoods, people's streets, commercial developments, industrial people are destroying the environment. And there's and so the ancient flyways are all disrupted and all of the migrating creatures have to find new ways to pass through. There used to be many tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of the roseate spoonbill and the herons and the cranes that would come through the basin. And they've had to find other ways. They've altered their, their flyways. And it's very sad. And uh, we are lucky that the basin was saved. America finally realized we need the wetlands. We can't wipe them out, fill them up, and build full of buildings. We have to have the wetlands. And it, as the way it was going, it was just going to be nothing left but a postcard that a, a dragonfly couldn't even get back in it. But now there's a chance that it's saved. That much, anyway. <laughs> what are the challenges working on such a large mural? Well, keeping things in scale is important, but I can draw, sketch quickly the sizes of the things that I want to portray and block them in with basic colors. And once they're there, then I can see I can see uh, what they're going to look like and make adjustments before I paint them a great deal of detail. I don't paint a lot of detail until the end. Uh, it's, it's hard climbing up and down, scaffolding all day long, hauling paint up and down, back and forth. It's difficult to direct helpers. Uh, oftentimes the helpers are not really as skilled as we would like. We, uh, you know, are lucky to have help at all with things like this. Uh, uh, the amount of paint it takes and the cost of the paint is a difficulty. The scaffolding, I have bought a lot of scaffolding over the years because I have painted now 500 murals in the last 50 years in many, many places. And so it's, uh, but uh, difficulty with weather because it's the winter time that I'm here and have this ability to do this right now, the time in my schedule. I have a lot of other bigger pieces waiting for me to go work on them. So time, money, equipment, paint, help, all of it's difficult. Climbing and moving everything around. <laughs> There's no money in this project for a, an electric lift or a, a boom truck, so I have to use manual scaffold. You have been working in Lafayette for several decades, and I'm sure you are very well known in the area. I'm from here, actually. I've been here since 1957. And the city, do they help you uh, with grants or other types of support? Not much. You are working with paints that need to be resistant to elements. Yes. Are they also uh, more um, toxic or than the other paints? Uh, no, these are ac acrylics, they're water-based. They, they don't need solvents. Uh, like uh, so many uh, oil base or um, the uh, the kinds of chemicals that you get in two part or three part mixes of materials. These are just simple water based paints, and uh, they're not that hard to work with. You're also doing murals on the Ohio River. Yeah, I've been painting on the Ohio River for about 35 years. Every summer, I go to uh, a number of different cities. And uh, the biggest one is in Portsmouth, Ohio. I've been working there since 1993, and I've completed over 70 murals on their riverfront uh, there in Portsmouth. Uh, the paintings are all about the history of their people, of their city, of the area. The murals portray uh, the uh, the development of the city. I, I started actually 2,000, well, several thousand years ago. There was a group of native people called, we have called them the mound builders, 
who built uh, lots of uh, of structures, earthworks, astounding some of them, some of the earthworks. And of course, when the white people came in the uh, all through the 1800s, they destroyed most of them, plowed them down and dug them up and built buildings on top of them and stuff like that. But a number of them have been saved. And I did a number of paintings with the uh, with the mounds and the mound builders, and then moving into historical era native peoples. The Shawnee tribes lived there before the white people came, the first pioneers. And then the uh, interactions and then the gradual development of the city. And so the 70 murals are a over uh, one half of a mile in American terms. I don't know how many meters that is, 2,500 feet. What would that be? 80, 800 meters? Uh, it's, it's very big. It's also seven meters tall like this and very long. And I go back every year and paint more. And it has formed a, a tourist attraction to their old downtown. That was the point. They were trying to draw visitors to their old riverfront in their old downtown to um, help with the repopulation and the, and the revitalization of business in their old downtown. And it was very successful, and I was asked to create uh, more projects like this. Paducah, Kentucky, we started in 1996, and it has become very famous. Uh, they have, in Paducah, have um, trained uh, tour guides who are who wear you know uh, uniforms and greet the river boats and take the tourists walking up and down the entire length of their downtown area to see those 60 something murals of their history and um the that old town uh, paducah has also got the american the national quilt museum and also um uh, a theater and galleries and a performing arts center and museums and uh, restored a beautifully restored 19th century downtown so it's uh, terrific and they have applied and received uh, membership in unesco world creative cities organization and uh, my mural project is a very big part of their certification for proof that they have decided to become an arts attraction they want to be an arts destination instead of an industrial city they're basing their future on being available for to have arts all kinds of arts for people to come and visit and buy and look at so uh we've done this in um uh, on the riverfront in cincinnati on the kentucky side we've done this in maysville kentucky point pleasant west virginia is one of the favorites it's pre-revolutionary war and it's all about the natives and the pioneers and the conflicts and the different ways of life i worked on that project for seven years many of these riverfront projects i've worked on over the years are um uh i'll work for oh six or eight weeks in one city and then six or eight weeks in the next and in the next and i I keep making new projects in each city every year. And that is how I have developed uh, so much work along the Ohio River. It's been uh, very rewarding for me to get to know so many people and so much history, to make so much work. And the work that we do there matters a lot to the people who live there. So it's very rewarding to me to do such um, meaningful work to have spent my life doing something meaningful my dog the shandar he's uh concerned about something here <laughs> what's going on bubba what are you barking at well um i'm sure you have some more questions i i have besides uh, the ohio river i've also worked uh a great deal of my work, my early work in Lafayette, Louisiana, was about the Acadians and the Acadian exile. Everyone in the world has heard of the Cajuns. Everybody likes Cajun food and Cajun music and Cajun culture, all the festivals and the Mardi Gras and everything. 
but how they got here is a, a tragic story. There were in Nova Scotia, what is now Nova Scotia, then it was Acadie in the 1600s. And they had been there 150 years. When the English took it over, they drove them out at gunpoint. They killed about half of the colonists who had been there for 150 years. They were trying to eradicate the language, the culture, the religion, and force them to be a Church of England, English-speaking, tax-paying English citizens, and they refused, and the English finally uh, drove them out. They were scattered all over the world. And uh, of the thousands, the few thousands of them who survived, many ended up in the city of Nantes. And I've gone to the city of Nantes on the west coast of France and painted uh, a mural there about the day that the um, French officials and a, and a wealthy apothecaries arranged to send five shiploads of Acadian refugees to Louisiana, to New Orleans. And the uh, the uh, project was first painted in uh, 93. I also then came to Louisiana and made a painting for the Acadian Memorial to to memorialize all the Acad the thousands of Acadians who died in the in the expulsion and showed a painting of Acadians arriving in Louisiana. And there were 85 families who came here <laughs> after that. And um, we found uh, descendants of each of those 85 original families. And they elected a family member who was the same age and gender as their ancestor to portray them in the painting. This painting is in the Acadian Memorial in St. Martinville, Louisiana. It's um, 11 feet and uh, 35 feet long, 11 feet tall. That uh, painting is pretty famous amongst Acadian culture people. Well, that amount of uh, historical painting is what... See, I was doing paintings like this before, a little um, surrealist, maybe. I did not know about history painting in the 1970s. But when I began working on the Acadian exile, uh, I had to learn how to research and paint, you know, a different era. What did their uniforms look like? What kind of clothes did they wear? What kind of weapons and utensils and implements? And what did the boats, what did their hats look like? What did the houses look like? I had to learn how to research. And all of that was before the, um, before the internet. So actually we had to drive from Louisiana to Canada to go to Moncton, our sister city in Moncton, to research as much as we could. We went to the Acadian village in Caracat, up in northern New Brunswick, to uh, visit with living history people who portrayed the era that the Acadians were driven out of, out of Acadie. Uh, many people don't realize, after seizing all of the farms and orchards. It had taken 150 years. The Acadians had built a very successful little colony there. And when the English took it over, they brought Scottish settlers in and plugged them into the farms and the orchards and the fisheries and the tanneries. And they renamed it Nova Scotia. But it was actually founded by the Acadian people. And the biggest pocket of living Acadians in today's world are here in South Louisiana, and Lafayette is the capital of Acadian culture. So because of my work with the Acadian exile, I'm well known to the Acadian people here and in other places around the world. And that expertise with historical painting, researching, and development of history is what gave me the ability to do historical murals in other cities and, and also in France. We started a festival here in Louisiana called um, the Festival International de Louisiane. And the uh, cities, as you know, most cities in Europe have an international festival every year where you bring performers, folkloric, uh, and, uh, you know, typique uh, music de, de région. Uh, and they, we have joined that uh, confederation of festivals and we exchange 
musicians and performers and artists and film and whatever every year. And uh, I came up with this idea of painting a flying violin to represent the Cajun fiddle flying out of the swamps and out into the world and out into the streets of the world. And I made a proposal to our sister cities to go paint this flying violin in our sister city in Moncton, Canada. Our sister festival in Surin, on the west side of Paris, we painted one. And we have one in an, uh, in Jodon, Belgium. And we also had one in uh, Derby, England, where we had another exchange with the University of Arts and Science. So I have this series of flying violins. And I, I painted the paintings free as a gift from my city to their city. They paid for the, the, the cities paid for the housing and the scaffolding and the paint and the helper. And the city of Lafayette won't money to fair. But uh, the gift was from me, from all of the Cajun people to each city we went to. And that got me to be a little bit more known in France, to be invited back to do a few other projects over the years. Uh, so I have uh, gone back to Canada and France and I've been to Vancouver and uh, Washington State and Colorado, California. Oh, Colorado, uh, Texas, Mississippi, Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia, Ohio, Indiana. I've painted oh, many, many places. How did Lafayette change? in terms of their approach to art? Well, there was, when I was growing up, there were no real recognized artists here. My art teacher in high school in the 60s uh, was one of the few artists who worked. He taught, uh, all of them taught. They had to have day jobs. They couldn't make a living as an artist. Lafayette in its beginnings was just a little hub city where service industries for the oil field companies had their bases here. Uh, there were lots of support industries for uh, setting up and running oil rigs all over South Louisiana. And Lafayette was the headquarters for that. And the oil business people really had no interest in art, especially not public art in those days. There was none. But my generation of the 60s, all of us who wanted to be artists and musicians, you know, theater and film and uh, all of sculpture, all of the arts, all of us were able to receive some encouragement when we were in high school. And when we graduated, we went to work as artists, uh, doing whatever we could do to make a living and create art. And there was a big wave of art and festival and music development in the city as a result of that throughout the 70s, along with the revival of a, the Acadian language, the French language and the, and the revival of French culture and the French, uh, French way of life uh, with the festivals and the music. There was a huge revival, uh, Renaissance, and uh, all of the arts in, in uh, Lafayette became uh, more public and, and more important and more feasible in the 70s and in the 80s. And then we all have children. Now our children are all grown. Where there was, there were five artists in Lafayette when I was a kid. And like I said, none of them were making anything public. There was a very small circle of people. In my generation, there are 50 of us who have been making art all of our lives. And now of our children, there are 500 who are making art of all kinds. So there's been a huge renaissance. Of course, the city, the population, the Acadians themselves are not much interested in buying art. <laughs> some do, and some have education and have traveled and, and buy art and are patrons and support these projects. But there are far more artists than buyers. And that's true most every city, I suppose. It's difficult to, to make a living. But now that there are, the next generation has 5,000 people who have an education about, about art, why they should have art, why they should make art, why they should buy art. So the art is growing generation by generation in Lafayette, and that's a very hopeful sign. 
if uh, if the uh, industrialists all over the world don't destroy the world, maybe there, there will be an, a very artful future for us in Lafayette. And I would say the administrations here now, I've watched um, the mayor, the city council, the uh, parish council and directors, business directors, with each generation, they have the the um, the political direction of the city, uh, the political leadership has learned that the public here likes art in that there are a lot of artists. They've also learned that many, many of the tourists and, and the visitors, the people who come to Lafayette, come here because it's a very artful place in a in a very rural state. Um, of course, we have New Orleans, and we have some arts, big arts in Baton Rouge, too. But uh, Lafayette has gotten to be very well known for having a very artful population, and people come here partly for that. So the administrations have learned to help support arts in whatever ways they can. The Arts Council has grown and grown, and we receive a lot of money from the state it goes through the Arts Council all over to all the arts councils in every city it's never you know you can get little grants and it's never very much but it's enough to help a whole lot of artists have a little bit of money to do a little bit of their projects and it helps a little at a time the consciousness of the necessity of funding art has grown a lot over my lifetime i've been working as i said for Oh, over 50 years I've been making art for a living and I've seen a huge change in the comprehension and the acceptance and support here in Lafayette. What kept you going? What motivated you? Something inside of me, uh, hard to define. Something in my soul I knew as a child that I was supposed to be making art and I didn't understand what it was uh, when I was young I uh, I just wanted to make great art <laughs> I when I began doing the history of the Acadians I realized that art could have a very valuable purpose not just for money but to have a reason and when I began painting historical murals for other cities and saw the difference that it made, I saw the difference it makes in their feelings about themselves. Most uh, Europeans grow up with paintings of their ancestors and their history all around them. The libraries, city hall, public buildings, you all have paintings of your history and your ancestors. In America, that's not so true. Uh, in a little oil field town like Lafayette was, there was nothing like that. And uh, the Cajuns were not well regarded by the rest of America, only saw the Hollywood portrayal, ignorant, barefooted, living in the swamps, can't speak English, dirty and stupid, a terrible, um, a terrible um, misconception. And uh, it's the, the, the Acadian revival uh, changed all of that and the Acadian people have respect for who they are and what they did and when I realized I could help be part of that in other cities too it became a purpose much much more important and much bigger purpose than uh, making art to be uh, popular or, or famous or something and all of that is really pretty pretty silly compared to having a real impact on the life of a culture that kept me going. I began to realize, I guess, uh, all throughout the 90s, I, I was very well aware that that's why I'm here. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. And that kept me going to have a reason, to have a, a need and to fulfill a purpose that keeps you going, you know? Would you be interested in visiting friends again or Canada well, murals? Yes, uh, uh, Jean-Louis Testude, who was the cultural attaché for the mayor of Suren, has brought me to France a few times to paint. And uh, he has another project for me 
the original uh, uh, violon avion, the, the flying violin I had painted in Sorin, was destroyed when the building was destroyed. And uh, they would like for me to recreate it on the town square and Centreville uh, sometime in the next year or so. And also, we have a sister city, Namur. Namur in Belgium is our sister city, and uh, they would like for me to come do a mural in Namur next year. We've been trying for three years, but COVID and politics, politics kept changing the, the, the possibility to go. So now we think we're finally, in the next year, going to be able to go back to Belgium. But uh, I, yes, I like Europe very much. Uh, you have, uh, in Europe, you have, uh, have you, you've had uh, civilization for so very long. Civilization is new in America, and appreciation of the arts, and appreciation of culture, appreciation of our own history is still just blooming in America. In the last uh, 50 years of my lifetime, I have seen in, a, in the rural America an awareness of the importance of history and culture, and it's, it's still burgeoning. But in Europe, you've had this realization for a thousand years. It's so civilized, and your and your food, and your wine, and your cultures are are, are very very nice to me. It suits my nature. I, I'm certain that I have had many lifetimes of European existence previous, <laughs> because I feel very much at home there. I would love to paint in Orléans. Yes, I've seen. Um, I've not seen very many graffiti murals that I really like. Good, there is good street art. The thing I don't like about what I, the street art I see is it's done so quickly um, with no preparation. And uh, one coat of paint sprayed right on, it's not going to last very long. Uh, I've been, took a, I took part in a festival, a mural festival in Canada, which um, uh, about uh, two years ago, two years ago, I think. And... Uh, some of the murals there were well done, but some of them, were the graffiti and the street art people, don't seem to care about preparing the wall first, and they don't seem to care about the, the quality and the, the, the number of coats, uh, the coatings of paint. It takes a lot of paint. You have to build up a big, heavy layer for it to last, and very lightly sprayed, um, very lightly sprayed on spray paint will not last outdoors. I used to paint a lot of uh, airbrush work in the 70s. I did a lot of work with air guns and airbrushes and spray cans. And I learned that the very thin, fine edges, the soft fades you get with air is beautiful. But those particles are just dust on the surface and they weather away very quickly and they don't last very long. So I quit using uh, spray equipment aerosols uh, for outdoor work because it just doesn't hold up. But I think that the street art people don't care because I, I think in, the, in, their, in their culture, somebody's going to come paint something else right on top of it within a year or three years. And it doesn't have to last long. They're constantly covering over each other's work again and again and again. So they don't care about longevity. They're an ongoing commentary, not a, a permanent piece of commentary, you know. You are more interested in becoming heritage, becoming a living legacy. Well, I'm more interested in developing consciousness within living cultures. I know that my paintings will not last forever either. It's slow motion, death, <laughs> but they last they last long enough to have an effect within the culture to develop, a, you know, uh, is in these little rural cities I was talking about, when uh, they walk down to the football and they see themselves, they see their ancestors. My father worked in that steel mill or my, my daddy worked in that cotton mill or my daddy worked in, my aunt worked in that linen mill. They, um, they've never seen themselves painted large like you do in Europe. In Europe, you grow up seeing your, paintings of your ancestors. Americans don't have that. So 
putting them up there gives them some sense of pride about who they were, who their parents, what they did, you know. Uh, and and when you see, when they see thousands, of, hundreds of thousands of people coming to visit the paintings of themselves, then it changes the way they feel about themselves. And uh, in the course of, uh, we know millions of people have gone to see these paintings up and down the Ohio River. And that has had an effect on the way that people feel about themselves. It's having an effect on the culture. In the cities that have decided to do this and maintain these projects and hire me to make more, they, they, they realize this, this kind of public art is uh, beneficial to the culture itself in intangible ways, not just those people, of course, they buy gasoline. They might stay in a hotel. They go eat in a cafe. They spend some money when they go to visit the paintings. But the intangible uh, re results of, uh, of thousands of people being proud of their culture and who they are, that, that's, that's really, really valuable. And that's what it is for me. It's not about... It's not about me leaving a legacy about me. It's not about me leaving uh, my work behind. It's about what effect am I having right now to help with living cultures to uh, to strengthen who they are, what their what their what their pur what their purpose is, and and, and w what do they want to become. That's what the work that I do is about. I know it's ephemeral, and w not long after I'm gone, it will be gone. But the effect it has had on the culture is what I'm interested in. Mr. Daffer, thank you so much for your um, your presence. And uh, I imagine it's very difficult to do the interview like this. He wants to say hello. <laughs> okay. We will. Uh, we will make some photographs.